Hello everyone, Matt Desch here, and we've got a special conversation for you today. You know, one of the fun parts of working at Iridium is learning about all the ways that our technology is used around the world. And in some cases, there's some really important stories that need to be told by those working to shine a light on some otherwise very uncomfortable subjects. So joining me today, as you can see, uh, is an award-winning investigative journalist who writes for the New York Times, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, and more. Um, Ian Urbina, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate you, you being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, most notably, uh, Ian is the mind and ink behind the Outlaw Ocean series, which then became a best-selling novel of the same name, a music project, and most recently had a major feature story in The New Yorker. So I encourage all of you to check those things out. Uh, Ian's The Outlaw Ocean Project is today a nonprofit journalism organization focused on high impact investigative stories, bringing needed attention to lawlessness at sea, an area of course that Iridium uh, is very involved in and very, um, as our systems are used over all the oceans. And as such, uh, we are very proud to support um, his efforts, and I'm honored to welcome to him today. So, Ian, if you don't mind, I'd just get into a few questions for you here. That'd be great. So, um, you know, the Outlaw Ocean Project has been a bit of a journey that has clearly been um, has been filled different difficult situa situations. But if we can start by going back in time a bit, uh, was there a particular moment in the early days of your investigations, say? I don't know, mid 2010s, I suppose, that you realize just how big a need there was to capture like the stories that you've been telling? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, the reporting began at the New York Times in 2014. The series ran in 2015 in the, in the newspaper. And so that, you know, kind of 12, 24 month period was the first round of really intense reporting. And, um, I think within three or four months of running around the globe and getting on ships, I saw just how invisible the workforce is um, and how brutal the conditions are on many of, especially fishing boats. Um, and then also just sort of the diversity of odd and seedy players that are out there, you know, repo men of the sea or sea slavers or arms traffickers or oil dumpers or you know it's just a, 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 a more of a diversity of characters than i had ever encountered on land so uh, and then on the other hand there were there were far fewer reporters than any other investigation we've done on land because very few people go out to sea and spend time so that sort of split that void um is what attracted me to stick with it I mean, that's uh, it's a heavily produced kind of view of the ocean, it seems like, from, you know, um, reality series and other things that we see. You've seen sort of all sides of it now. I guess, you know, aside from the most recent experience that, that was shared in The New Yorker, uh, which I'd like to get to in a moment, but, you know, are there any others that come to mind as being particularly difficult, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, Matt, I should just pause and say thank you to you and to Iridium, you know, being a, a sort of protector technologically um, of what I do and, and the safety of my whole team. Um, we couldn't do it without your help. I know you didn't want me to plug Iridium, but I do, you know, need to thank you for having been with us for, you know, a half decade. Um, you know, uh, the sort of sketchy, challenging situations tend to be in um conflict zones you know so uh, somalia um before libya i'd say that the sort of hairiest situation we got in uh was in somalia and specifically a, a breakaway state called puntland which is the the actual horn of africa across from yemen and it's kind of like what texas is to washington dc puntland is to mogadishu in that it's part of the country but there's a real cultural um independence there and um in Putinlan, a lot of you know arms trafficking and guerrillas that are fighting in Yemen launch from there. A lot of the piracy that you've heard about and Captain Phillips' piracy launches from Putinlan. So we went to Putinlan and uh, Brazilian photographer and I and uh, began investigating some concerns off the coast of Putinlan and ended up 
um, falling out of favor with the local leaders and sort of had our you know 20 man protection squad stripped from us and we're stuck you know in Puntland with only two guys and kind of no way out there were no ground transport the only other westerners at that time were at a CIA drone base you know 20 miles away and they couldn't really help us um so and again i had you know my only mode of communication was an iridium satellite phone and as we hid out in the compound where we were staying which is a sort of hotel um and we hid out on the roof um so that the hotel staff wouldn't know we were still there um you know for a good 20 hours we were completely unsure as to how we would make it out of the compound much less the state um obviously we got out ultimately um but um that was um a pretty scary experience um I, i'd say you know and i'm uh it's fascinating the kind of thing, the, the issue, the things that you've seen and, and experienced. Um, thank you for the kind words with the team. Most of us don't get a chance to see what life is like for a lot of our customers in the ocean. Um, I guess there's something like 56 million people that work, I guess, at sea. Um, I, obviously, most of them are in fishing. Um, you know, obviously, we have seen things produce shows like Deadliest Catch and, and that sort of thing, but. I imagine that's the exception versus what's really normal when you look at the world as a whole. Uh, you know, what is the experience if you can describe it for most of those people out there on the oceans? Yeah, I mean, I think um, if you think of the maritime space first, if you split it down the you know in the middle, if you will, 1.2 million are in merchant marine. So these are carrying you know oil, grain, Nike shoes, what have you, stuff. Um, and then the other 53, 54 million are on fishing vessels. The near shore fishing vessels, those guys, and it's a mostly male world, go out, you know, uh, for a day or a week at, at a time. The distant water fishing fleet is the really Dickensian, brutal, grinding, difficult work. Those boats sometimes stay out for over a year, sometimes two years. And the developing world, distant water, fishing fleet. So poorer countries, the fishing fleets that are launching from those places, those are the boats that we really focus on because that's where the real human rights, labor, environmental um, concerns most reside. You're not going to find the kinds of things I cover on typically on a tuna vessel owned by Chicken of the Sea, you know, a Western com company, because they just have the money and the brand concern about uh, avoiding sea slavery, but um, but sort of other fleets, not so much because they're off radar. Um, so on that subsector of vessels, which is not a small number of people, um, you, you're you're dealing with um, hygienically just unfathomably dirty workplaces and and living places. Um, you're dealing with, I mean, if you imagine a ship as uh, factory, but this factory has as its floor skating rink slippery surface, right? So it's usually coated with an impot, you know, fish guts that's stored up over a long time and can't really be washed away. So it's incredibly slippery. It's moving up and down like an elevator going up between three or four floors at all times. And it's sort of funhouse style. The floor is tipping and, you know, it, um, so it's not staying horizontal. And then you're you're working 20 hour shifts with the intense stuff happening in the dead of night because that's when you can catch the most fish. And you're working with sort of not OSHA approved machinery, if you if you know what I mean. In other words, these are huge machinery, you know, spinning winches and huge industrial arms pulling, you know, 10 ton nets um, that don't have any real protections on them. If that's the setting you're talking about, you can see why it's the most dangerous profession. So it's it's an unusually dangerous setting um, from a workplace standpoint. And then as a living space, it's incredibly dirty. You know, your skin never gets dry because you're wet all the time. And so you have a lot of cracking and cuts and, and the possibility for infection is very high and the boats don't tend to have medicine and you can't go back to shore if you get an infection. You know, food poisoning is common. 
and it gets really severe. And so these sorts of things are other drivers of why the death rate tends to be very really high on these boats. But you've had to get on a lot of these ships to do your work. I mean, that must be uh, must be a challenge. What is the challenge? I assume you don't just sign, you know, you don't just uh, get a ticket and get on these ships. And what about like these refugee rafts that you're on? I mean, how's the process different on getting to these these things to even work with you and your team? Yeah, I mean, so um, th- we try to do all the stories with some portion of the reporting at sea. You know, one of the few distinctions that we try to lean into our reporting, you know, offshore. Um, and so what that typically means is to get out into the space, you're typically going to have to go on either an advocacy vessel. So that's going to be Sea Shepherd or Greenpeace, most likely, or one of these advocacy conservation groups. And they have huge boats that will be going out in the space. Law enforcement vessels, so Coast Guard of the relevant country, and you convince them to take you out. Um, or navies, um, medical vessels, supply vessels um, that are, say, what are called mother ships. They often go out to transshipment vessels that, you know, fishing vessels that stay out there and keep shipping. So figuring out, you know, knowing the different options for how to hitch a ride is step one. And then convincing the captains of those boats why they might want to help you is step two. Um, and then once you get out into the space, getting on to the target vessel, that usually requires a good translator who can convince the captain on that vessel why it's safe and possibly even of interest to them to allow some photographer and journalist on board. Amazing. But, you know, um, maybe jumping to this recent article in this amazing documentary that uh, we just saw, you know, they show a real diversity of people from all over the Middle East and Africa, but it seems like the one common denominator was, um, you know, escaping a war-torn country, uh, violence, human trafficking, you know, other terrible situations. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure we can all really appreciate this. You know, these are pretty, you know, desperate people, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as you said, so so the, the recent reporting was a close look at the Mediterranean and sort of this phenomena that people have seen on the news where, especially since 2015, um, you've had tens of thousands of migrants um, who are crossing the Mediterranean from Libya, typically, and trying to make it to Europe. And so the the investigation we did was taking a close look at um, why are so many people trying to cross the Mediterranean? And what efforts are being made to block them from from making it across? Uh, most of these migrants, as you said, are fleeing poverty and climate change. You know, sort of the repercussions of climate change, um, and some are also fleeing war and and sort of terrorist organizations. Um, uh, and you know, a lot of them are getting blocked from making the trip across the Mediterranean by um, the Libyan Coast Guard, which is funded by the EU and keeping, you know, trying to keep them in Libya. Um, So, you know, what we wanted to see was what happens when those people get turned back and sort of what is the brutal reality within Libya and specifically the prisons they they get sent to. Um, So that's what we investigated. Thanks for telling those stories. I mean, one of the things that struck me was just the consistent desire of the refugees to be able to communicate with family, you know, let them know that they're okay. It seems to be like the first, one of the first things people cared about other than just being alive, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you better than anyone I think knows that we've all in the last decade, decade and a half become quite um, reliant and, a, a, you know, sort of addicted to the assumption and the reality of staying in touch with each other, you know, um, and that's as true for migrants, you know, from a desperately poor village in Guinea-Bissau and uh, me in Washington, D.C., or you in Virginia, you know. um, uh, And so, you know, one of the, like you say, one of the really uh, striking things is you can have these migrants coming from Eritrea or, you know, Jordan or, you know, South Africa, and they may not have a cent to their name, but they have a cell phone and they're fluent in using it. And 
they're sort of used to having the ability to communicate with each other and and um so um and that's one of the one of the parts of the reporting we did for this investigation was a five week embed on a Doctors Without Borders ship on the Mediterranean that was there attempting to rescue migrants if they made it past the Libyan Coast Guard and in, in international waters. And when the Doctors Without Borders folks would scoop up the migrants and bring them on shore, first they obviously attend to their medical needs, but then the next thing that everyone wants, all the migrants want to know is, is their internet? <laughs> you know, like, do they have a, a way to, um, you know, um, make their brain feel whole now that their body has been put back uh, in order. Um, and, um, you know, so that, uh, and there wasn't, and that was a real source of growing tension on the vessel that the migrants were eager to tell their loved ones where they were and, and to find out where they should be going if they, if they did make it to the other side. So satellite devices aren't, are, uh, are I guess, uh, desired and wanted. I assume you, some of the few devices you had uh, came in handy during some of those times as well, I would imagine. Without a doubt. No, I mean, you know, we always, um, so any, I had a team with me of four and um, I have everyone who Im embeds with me that are really strict rules on um, wearing a, a tracking device, which is satellite, you know, sort of a Garmin. Uh, um, device. Uh, and then I also tend to have two Iridium phones uh, that allow me to to um, stay in voice communication with our security and my family and my editors. Yeah, well, I'm glad we can help keep you connected. Um, but I'm, I'm just even fascinated. How do you mentally prepare to embark on these expeditions, knowing that like in the past experience, you may end up making an unexpected stay in another country against your will. These aren't always safe situations. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, truth be told, I never think about the unexpected stay. It's happened a couple of times and most brutally recently in Libya. Um, but that doesn't tend to um, uh, occupy my mind because I try to do everything to prevent that from happening, um, even if I'm not always successful. Um, the preparation, um, really having done this for about two decades now, I've learned a lot, most especially from photographers, because they tend to be, you know, often the ones who are um, going deepest into videographers and photographers. They, you know, us writers, we can call it in, you know, photographers cannot, you know, they have to be in there to get the shot. And they tend to um, have really good, um, tricks, you know, for being a, a, a good traveler, you know, in, in rough circumstances. And so I always try to pay attention to how my photographers pack and what they bring and why and which brands they use. And, um, and so my kit is pretty good now. And, um, you know, I, dietary stuff is really important for me because uh, on a lot of these ships, you've got to make sure you're getting enough calories and the right kind of calories. Um, and then uh, um, the tech is a huge part of the, I'd say 60% of what I pack tends to be tech. You know, it's solar, you know, energy sources, it's, you know, iridium phones, it's um, backup computers, uh, batteries, 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 you know, um, it's all this sort of stuff so that I can um, capture and usually transmit. Because again, in Libya, for example, we were taken by a militia as you now know, and um, all of our stuff was confiscated and luckily uh, and and ultimately destroyed by the militia. Well, luckily, I had a pretty strict policy on my team and on myself that the end of every reporting day, we put stuff in the cloud. And so a huge amount of our footage and the reason we were able to produce the New Yorker piece in the end, um, it was a shadow of its former self. We, we didn't have everything that we filmed, but uh, we had a lot of it thanks to that policy and thanks to the technology that allowed us to be transmitting stuff into the cloud each day. That's, that's incredible. Um, you know, in this in that specific situation, how long was it before the authorities like realized who you were, and was that a did that help or did it make it worse uh, when they did? Yeah, I mean, so the specifics were we were taken by a militia in Libya in Tripoli. And the militia, its official name 
and it's actually a part of the UN recognized government, but there are various militias that are part of the government. This militia went by the, the name of the Libyan Intelligence Service, and they had been tracking us and our reporting for the you know entire week we were doing the reporting and were not super thrilled with what we were working on, which was sort of abuse in these facilities, including murder. Um, so when they took me and my team, three of my team were actually, again, with security and a convoy headed to dinner. And I had stayed at the hotel because indeed I was supposed to put stuff up in the cloud and talk to my wife and get some work done. So I just said, no, I'm not gonna go out. I got too much work. The militia came for me at the hotel room, 12 you know, armed men you know, came into the room and um, hooded me, beat me for about an hour. My wife was on the phone with me and heard the beginning of it. So she immediately sprung into action. We had a security you know, plan that we had established you know, from prior trips and on this one. And so she reached out immediately to key folks in the US State Department. And the, it's probably a big reason we're still alive uh, because that began right then. The militia took us, they took the other three in the middle of an intersection in a pretty coordinated hit, you know, hooded them, and we all ended up at a secret prison in Tripoli, where we were then held for the next six days and interrogated. They knew who everything about. They knew they had recording in our rooms that I heard. They, they knew everything about who we were. So there was no mystery to anyone involved who we were. In fact, who we were is probably why we got picked up which is we were journalists in a country that didn't really want that kind of a story told. Um, but uh, luckily, U.S. State Department, White House, and the Dutch Foreign Service, I had a Dutch filmmaker with me, um, began applying pressure, pressure on the Libyan president and the Lib Libyan attorney general. And after six days, finally, we were um, negotiated out. Scary stuff. I think your wife deserves some awards there, too. You can see that. Um, Maybe on the lighter side, you know, could you tell us a bit more about this Outlaw Ocean music project? Um, <laughs> you know, it sounds like a combination of cultures that really delivers a, a unique uh, soundtrack there that uh, I just think people should check out. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. No, it's one of my, uh, it, it makes me very proud and happy. Um, so this was an experiment in, you know, I have a 17 year old son and he, I've been a journalist for 30 years and he, he doesn't really read what I write, and that frustrates me. Uh, he's a smart kid and reads; a, it consumes a lot of information. But he um, gets a lot of his information from alternate platforms, you know, TikTok and Facebook and Spotify and YouTube. And and so the thought I had was, well, how do we get at younger people like him with stories like this, you know? Um, and at the New York Times, the the sort of old school model was always well, just do a better job at convincing them to come to your restaurant, you know, like bring them to you, but do a better job at it. And, you know, in the in the age of Uber and sort of Amazon and sort of outreach, I thought, well, what if we took our stories out to where they are, whether they're, you know, a, a young person in Taiwan or Venezuela or the U.S.? Um, and so we thought, well, why don't we take one place where a lot of young people are in the millions is games. Um, and another place is Spotify, is music platforms. And so what if we convince musicians, classical, hip hop, electronic, what have you, to partner with us, read the story, take sounds from the reporting, the video footage of the story, make an album in their own style, donate the album to us as a nonprofit, and then we'll publish the music on Spotify and we'll pair it with footage from the stories. And this was a crazy, weird idea that ended up working really well. And so now the Outlaw Ocean Music Project has, you know, more than 500 musicians from 60 countries, um, 90 million listeners. And a lot of what's interesting is the streaming revenue from the music, some of it goes into the nonprofit or 50% um, of it goes back to the musician Musician and 50% goes into the nonprofit to fund more stories. So that's a really neat thing. But we also get at, you know, two out of every 10 listeners clicks over to the stories. And so we're getting a lot of reading traffic and viewing traffic that we wouldn't have otherwise access. Um, 
and and it's just neat to see your stories turn into music you know the creativity that musicians bring is something that i kind of marvel at every every album so it's been great Fascinating. I, I really encourage people to check that out. What an interesting sort of angle that uh, this grew into it. But I mean, the work that you've been doing is very, very important. Um, stories are amazing. Um, I'm glad to see you home and safe here in D.C. Um, and uh, probably yearning to get back out there, I imagine, to do something else dangerous and, and crazy. But um, we're really proud at Iridium to be able to support your mission and and uh, and keeping you safe and you and your crew safe. And I'm just glad you could share a little time and energy with us uh, to explain just how important this work is that you're doing. But thank you again, Ian, for, for joining me here today. No, well, Matt, thank you. And thank, thank you to Iridium for, again, all the support for so long. All right, take care. Thanks everybody for joining us.